this, yeah. right? And, and rethinking what it is that he wants. And that scene when he's in the bar with Sylvie, and she's saying, well, what is it that you want? What is it that you want? And he's sort of going through and discovering in the moment that, you know, I want my friends back. Yeah. And, and that sense of community and connection is the thing that's become important to him. You know, when in the very beginning, 15 years ago, he was a very isolated sort of character. Well, I think you've, you've hit upon something that I've been thinking about for 15 years. Um, I think I was so grateful when we made the first Thor movie to have been given a, a, a narrative arc by the late, great Don Payne who wrote the screenplay, which was with, filled with such pathos. And Loki's origin story is one of enormous pain and heartbreak. And in that film, he discovers he doesn't belong in Asgard, that he was adopted, and that he was an orphan, and he was left to die on a frozen rock. And he feels on the margins immediately, this isn't my family, this isn't my home. And that, heart, that grief is what then hardens into grievance, which becomes the engine of his villain in Avengers. And it's that feeling of not belonging, not having a community. And I think the journey in Loki as a series is that he finds a community, he finds friends. And I think his relationships with Mobius and Sylvie particularly are, take on a shape that he wouldn't have recognized before. He, it, that these are real relationships where he really cares. And it's extraordinary for a character of such elevation in a way that the center of him is remarkably human. He just wants his friends back. Yeah, he's, he's very relatable in that way. You know, he's made mistakes, he's coming around, he's trying to rethink. So many mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know, you're not only the star, but an executive producer on this show. Tell us a little bit about your creative involvement. I have loved doing, being an executive producer. and. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the title for me represents practically a place at the table in the development of the story, in the development of the narrative and the course of the, the tone, the, the, the kind of imaginative space we were occupying as creatives. Um, I was really passionate about creating a show that had um, conviction and sincerity and vulnerability that leaned into um, these philosophical questions about fate and free will that was able to, to be entertaining and had a propulsive momentum but felt like it was about something and I encouraged everybody if I had any, any power to persuade them to lean into the sincerity of those questions. And actually, um, that's where Loki works best, is when he's driven by very profound um, forces that are, I feel, that feel very human, um, and, and, and excavating the big questions. And we had, in the, I was able to be in the writer's room um, with uh, both, both seasons. Um, uh, the first season uh, led, was led by Michael Waldron and the second season was led by Eric Martin. But those are such unique opportunities for, for us, uh, uh, certainly for me, because there's time to dream, there's time to free associate and, um, and talk about, write something on a whiteboard and discuss it. And I, I do remember to your point one morning coming in and I just wrote glorious purpose on the whiteboard. And I said, wouldn't it be extraordinary if the spine of this season was that theme? That we were re-examining re and redefining glorious purpose for Loki and for Mobius. What's Mobius's purpose? What's Sylvie's purpose now that she has done what she came here to do, which is kill he who remains? Can she live freely? Does she know how to? B15 is an agent in the TVA, finds out in season one that she had a life on the timeline. Does she stay? Does she leave? What's the TVA's purpose? This morally ambivalent institution that they thought they were the good guys, but maybe they're the bad guys. Can the institution be repurposed for something better? And um, those were really 
thrilling conversations, and sometimes it was, uh, I had the privilege of leading the set, I suppose, and creating a tone. Um, and one of the most enjoyable things about that was, was sometimes just lighting a bonfire underneath the scene, by which I mean reminding everybody of the, the, the sort of basic truth of, of creating fiction, which is no matter how much writing and how much dreaming and how much planning you've done, when you're on the set, you've got to remember this has never happened before and it matters. And the more you can commit to the, the thrill of that spontaneity, that these challenges that Mobius and Loki and Sylvie and OB and Casey and B-15 are facing, for them, they're real and the stakes are high and they have problems to solve and the clock is ticking and they've got to solve it now. And then when you're playing that game, it's just the most thrilling. That's when I love this job. I, you know, I've read that T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets was sort of an influential text for you during the creation of this season. Tell us a little bit about how this post-World War II text connects to the Asgardian God of Mischief. <laughs> <laughs> Firstly, thank you so much. You've clearly done an enormous amount of, of research. I did a lot of Googling. It's <laughs> <laughs> a huge compliment. Okay, this is the truth. Um, at the end of the filming of season one, we were, I think we were in the last day of filming, the last, maybe it was the day before, and Kevin Wright, our absolutely extraordinary producer of both seasons, came up to me in a tea break uh, with Eric Martin, who had been on, on the writing staff of, of season one. And he said to me, okay, I think, this is the end of the first chapter. What's season two about? And I heard myself say, I just quoted a passage from the Four Quartets, which is a poem I love, and it's one of the, right towards the end. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. And I can't explain where it came from, but basically it was a, Eliot expressed far more eloquently and articulately than I could where I wanted to go, which was we had broken this character down. We'd, we'd cracked his psyche open with existential doubt and crisis, but it wasn't, the journey wasn't over. And I thought, how do we bring it full circle? That's why that line to arrive at where we started and know the place for the first time. And it became a kind of uh, North Star. And it's been a generating conversation between all of us. Like, what does that mean? Do we go back to the beginning? Where did we start? We started with a young boy who was a prince who was told, only one of you can ascend to the throne, but you were both born to be kings. And is the ending a throne, but a throne that comes in a shape you would never recognize, uh, and with a burden he would never have understood. And then going back to glorious purpose, that you know, sort of <clears throat> immortal line the artist in Avengers: "I am Loki of Asgard, I am burdened with glorious purpose." To arrive at where we started and know the place for the first time, as Mobius says, sometimes purpose is more burden than glory. And now I started reading the four quartets, and um, it's the poem itself is such, a, it's such an extraordinary work of literature and art. It's very abstract, and I think is about is Eliot making sense in in um, the waste in the wake of all that loss of life, of of grief and rebirth, and and time and memory, and how time time perhaps isn't linear. Um, it's much more complex. And we were telling a story which was, I, then I opened the, the first page of the Four Quartets, and I think the very first line is, time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. And I gave a copy to Eric Martin, 
and two months later he presented the first episode and Loki was time slipping from time present into time past and into time future. So I'm sort of hoping that I think, you know, I think Elliot had it, I sort of gave it, I gave it to Eric and said, I don't know if this will help you, I hope it does. Um, let it, you know, take a line and let it inspire you. I just knew it was a, a rich source of material. There's another line I think um, um, in the poem, How Does It Go? And this really relates to, I think you've just seen episodes five and six, am I correct? Yes, yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's a beautiful passage in, in, in the later, the latter part of the last quartet, which runs something like this. And what you thought you came for is only a shell, a husk of meaning, from which the purpose breaks only when it is fulfilled. Either you had no purpose, or the purpose is beyond the end you figured and is altered in fulfillment. And I looked at it, I thought, that's Loki. You know, the, the, and what you thought you came for is only a shell, a husk of meaning. Anyway, I, I draw inspiration from everywhere, and I thought, well, you can't find better inspiration than T.S. Eliot, so I'll take it. <laughs> um, and um, so, yes, occasionally I would, I, I would quote T.S. Eliot um, on the set, but, but I quoted lots of other things too. You know, you're such an accomplished stage actor as well. You, you know, you've done Othello and Hamlet, and, and as I was telling you earlier, my favorite. Uh, a revival of Pinter's portrayal on Broadway. And, you know, I, I wonder, with, with the isolation uh, and the lack of connection that Loki initially feels, like, how much of an emotional thread do you feel between Loki and some of the other characters you played? That's such an interesting question. Um, mm. <laughs> One of the things I found most fascinating, endlessly fascinating, every time I've played Loki, is the tension between his exterior and his interior life. That there is a presentation often of a very playful, very charming, charming, very controlled, collected, witty, uh, strategic, um, mischievous character. But behind the mask of the playfulness and the mischief is something much more turbulent, much more chaotic, and much more uncertain. That there is a vulnerability and a uh, emotional fragmentation and a desire for connection that gets distorted on the way. It's a, it's in his heart. That's where he lives. But somehow it, it never finds its way out. Except in certain moments when he, when the a, a dramatic event breaks the mask and you see his truth, um, and I've always found that tension fascinating between what is presented on the outside and what's going on on the inside. And I suppose there is a there are some other characters I've played who have that tension. Um, well, actually, Robert in Betrayal is someone who suppresses his pain. And then, because the pain isn't being expressed in an in a open way, it gets, it gets misshapen on the way out. Um, I loved performing that. Um, but I also believe that all human beings are incredibly complex. We're all really complex, and we contain multitudes. And, um, you know, we have many selves inside us, and we don't present all those selves all the time. You're a different person at work to who you are when you're ordering a cup of coffee, or who you are with your family or at home. So, um, I'm trying to think of another character that's like that. But Jonathan Pine is is quite like that in the, the way. Night the night manager. Um, he as 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 a John Le Carre called him the close observer, and as a field agent who is taking on different identities to collect information to pass on to the intelligence services. He has to dissemble and pretend and present and dissimulate and um, 
So he's got this chameleonic quality, and you wonder if there's a center to that human being. I think there is, but I think he plays with, he moves the center for himself for his, um, as part of his mission. And the night manager is coming back for season two. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's a sort of like funny detective thriller with Owen Wilson, and it's almost like sort of like right. a buddy cop comedy, yes. too. So, so tell me a little bit about that part of it, working with Owen Wilson. Owen Wilson is the absolute best. Um, and he gave so much to this. Um, he committed himself so totally to it. I remember when we started the first season, we sat down for an afternoon, because Mobius, of course, is almost a scholar of Loki. He knows Loki better than Loki does. And he wanted me to take him through my journey up to that point of playing Loki. So we watched, we watched some clips and we talked a bit. And he asked me, what, Tom, what, what do you love about playing Loki? And, I, and, I, and I, I think I said something like, I just love that he's so, he's got such range. And I get to play, like if, if Loki's a keyboard of a piano, I get to play the light twinkly keys up top of wit and charm and playfulness, but I also get to play the heavy keys down in the left hand about grief and pain and loneliness and loss. And in this first scene of the first episode of the first season, in, he quoted that back to me um, as Mobius. So sort of as part of the interrogation, he said, see, I can play the heavy keys too. Um, and um, his capacity for invention is just, I, I, he's so spontaneous, he's so alive on set. Um, there are so many uh, examples of that. In the first episode of this season, um, when Mobius and Loki meet Ouroboros, played by the radiantly joyful Ki Hui Kwan. Just fantastic. And um, there's, a, there's a scene where um, they both have this enormous challenge, but there are great risks. Loki may be uh, disassembled at a molecular level and never reassembled again, and Mobius may have his skin peeled off by radiation. <laughs> and uh, Key, as Ob said, are you both ready? And um, I think the scene ended there, and Owen improvised as Mobius. He said, well, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm not sure if I already have to have my skin peeled off. <laughs> and then so I have to say, what well, am I ready to be molecularly disassembled and never reassembled again? I mean, say, well, actually, I'd rather have that. <laughs> you, talk, you get deleted from all of time forever. And he goes, yeah, but at least you don't get your skin peeled off. <laughs> and I said, but at least you get to live. And he said, what's the quality of life with no skin? <laughs> it's just perfect. Owen Wilson, genius. Um, and, but it wasn't just his capacity for invention. He... I think he really loved the philosophical nature of the relationship. Loki and Mobius talk about big ideas, and I hope the audience have found those things, found those scenes interesting. We loved playing them. And we used to talk as well about, because you're right, it is these two detectives following trails of breadcrumbs across the timeline, and this unlikely pairing. Um, and perhaps even Owen and I have kind of an unlikely pairing, but we, we really, we, we get on so well, we have to have similar taste in things. And um, in, in generating, in, in working on the scenes, we would agree that they always work best when Mobius and Loki were passionately disagreeing with each other. <laughs> that they had a different point of view about what the next step should be, and that we should keep the, we used to talk about keeping the teeth in the scene um, and not not sort of um, keeping it sharp. That actually, it would be fun because we were in such passionate conflict, if that makes sense. I can't speak more highly of Owen. I loved working with him. And it's been a long journey. It's been, um, you know, 44 to five years of our lives. So, yeah, yeah it's been great. Yeah, and, and it's so interesting to see some of the scenes, like, um, like in the Automat, which is, you know, again, one of these, like, really fun retro-futuristic elements yeah. Um, you know, sort of a callback to the original Loki that we all met, uh, you know, when 
you have one scene with Mobius where uh, you're saying, well, yeah, I, I know your, your emotions were a little out of control just now, but remember when I was ticked off at my father and brother and then tried to invade New York with, a, with an alien army. <laughs> and it's just such a contrast from who he was and, and who we know him to be now in, in Loki at the end of season yes, two. It's, it's actually almost as if um, Mobius has been a kind of um, patient analyst for Loki and he's done some growth and he's done some personal growth and, and now Loki can return the favor and say, it's okay, sometimes our emotions get the better of us, you know, we all make mistakes. I once tried to, um, you know, take over this New York City with an alien army. <laughs> it's a bad day in the office. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it is fun it, it, and it also it's important to remember and we always try to remember that, that the show's called Loki and and therefore the whole world that we created, we wanted to infuse with that playfulness and whimsy. I feel like that's who the character has always been in, in our human consciousness. He's represented um, playfulness, he's the trickster, he's the boundary crosser, he's disruptive, he's spontaneous, he's mercurial, he's unexpected, he's unconventional. And we wanted the whole, every character in the show to have those qualities, that they were all a little bit good and a little bit bad. The TVA was uncertain and full of doubt, a little bit good, a little bit bad. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's been the most um, fulfilling sandbox playing for so long. Well, on that note, it's been wonderful watching you in this role for the last 15 years. Uh, and thank you so much for, for sharing all of these insights with us. You know, everyone give it up for Tony. For